Uh, all right, hello, I'm Alex Braylon, and today I'm presenting work I did with Omar Alonso and Matt Lees on how to measure inter-annotator agreement for all sorts of complex data. Um, so first off, let's review what is the point of measuring inter-annotator agreement. Uh, when we collect labels from workers, we assume that if the task is well-defined and objective and the workers are capable and engaged, then mostly we should see the workers agreeing with each other on what the correct labels are. Um, so what we want is a quantitative measure of inter-annotator agreement that can answer these important questions like, is our labeled data set of high enough quality to be useful? Is the task well-defined and objective? Are the annotators reliable? Are the items being annotated too difficult or ambiguous, uh, et cetera? So let's, um, let's look at this very simple example then of an annotation task where annotators are asked whether or not there's a penguin in this image. Here, two of the annotators agree that there is a penguin and uh, one does not. That's what's called the observed agreement, the fraction of label pairs that match. In the case of categorical labels, they have to match exactly. Now to put that number in perspective, it's generally compared to what is called the, the chance agreement, which is the kind of probabilistic expectation of how many pairs would match simply by chance. So for example, in this, this categorical labeling task, um, any two labels might agree just by accident, uh, which could depend on the prevalence of each category. And even bad data would still have some amount of uh, expected chance agreement. So what we really want to know is how much better than expected chance agreement is the observed agreement. And there are several measures in the literature that do this kind of comparison between fraction of matched pairs observed versus um, matched pairs expected by chance. Now, our topic of interest is how about more complex annotation tasks? For example, here, the task is to caption an image and the response space can be any free text input by the worker. So this response space can be so large that any methods looking only at exact match will no longer work because you'll almost never get any exact matches. And there's a very large variety of this kind of uh, complex task. Annotators might be asked to rank elements in a list or translate sentences between languages, draw multiple bounding boxes or key points in an image, highlight spans of text in a document, or produce a syntactic parse tree of a sentence uh, or whatever else you can imagine. So in our work, we uh, we try to do, we, we conduct a, um, a large scale investigation. I mean, the first that we know of ac across multiple diverse complex annotation tasks. And in order to do this, we show that um, existing evaluation metrics for each task can be converted into distance functions uh, for measuring partial credit rather than exact match. Uh, and then these can be used in combination with a general form of the inter-annotator agreement measure known as Krippendorf's alpha. And in, in doing this, we identified a key limitation of Krippendorf's alpha, which is its reliance on mean distances, which can uh, lead to mistakenly discard good data. Uh, to overcome these limitations, we propose some um, inter-annotator agreement measures that compare the distributions of observed and expected distances instead of just their means and find that this is a more reliable approach. So let's get into it by starting about uh, so talking about how we use um, Krippendorf's alpha. So Krippendorf's alpha uses a distance function that uh, it compares labels uh, instead of relying on exact match. And this distance function plugs in here to get this ratio of observed distances to the distances expected by chance. And this introduces us to one of the distinctive problems when measuring agreement for complex data as opposed to simple data. That problem is the choice of the distance function. The basic requirements for a distance function are non-negativity, symmetry, and triangle inequality. So there's this generalized form of Krippendorf alpha. It's potentially very versatile, but we don't really know um, very much about how well it works across various complex tasks because there, there are only really a couple of studies that have used it on uh, very specific complex tasks uh, rather than uh, like cross-task studies that we know of. So we wanna know how well does this work in general. And um, one of our realizations is that for any given complex data set, there, chances are that there is an existing evaluation function. And with minor manipulations, uh, these evaluation functions can be adapted into distance functions to plug into the, the Krippendorf's alpha form in order to be generally applied across tasks. So for example, 
when evaluating machine translations, traditionally you might use like the blue score or for comparing ranked lists, people might use Kendall's tau. And these, these are evaluation functions that can be manipulated through inversion, et cetera, in order to make them into viable um, distance functions. Uh, all right, so, so to see this idea in action, let's start with a pretty complex task, translations. Here we have three example Japanese sentences. Each one is translated into English sentences by five workers. Oh, sorry. Uh, now let's pick a distance function, say the glue score, which is related to the blue score that I just mentioned. And we'll measure distances between all pairs of sentences with the smaller, uh, smaller distances representing better glue scores. Uh, now, if you look at this heat map, you see the blocks next to the diagonal uh, being more purple, indicating that pairs of translations of the same source sentence tend to have smaller distances. These are the observed distances, the distances between intra-item annotations. On the other hand, we see off the diagonal, this big orange space, these are the expected distances for the chance correction term, which is estimated by comparing totally unrelated sentences. So if workers were writing sentences that were extremely different from each other, then their observed agreement could start to look like the chance expected agreement. And with that, you have Krippendorf's alpha for this translation data set. This raises a question that we did not have to answer for simple tasks where the distance function was zero one. And that is what should my distance function be for my complex task? Uh, there are often a good variety of reasonable choices for any given task. So how do we choose one and does it matter? Intuitively, if the data set is reasonably good, we want to see a distinction between the observed uh, distances and the expected distances. Uh, in other words, the intra-item distance should look pretty purple and the across-item distance should look pretty um, orange. And we can motivate this further by referencing this field of distance metric learning, where the goal is to learn a distance function that puts points with the same label close together while pushing away points that have different uh, labels. Let's take this example and compare two distance functions then. The glue score, which uh, I just introduced, and the blue score, which was its predecessor. Um, so what we see pretty clearly visually is that the blue score seems a lot worse at distinguishing observed distances from expected distances. It's a lot blurrier, whereas the glue has a nice crisp contrast between what's on the diagonal versus what's off the diagonal. And there's an important implication here, which is that the choice of distance function does matter, because if you use an insensitive distance function, your measured interannotator agreement score might be so low that you decide to blame the data and throw it away or conversely accept data that's unreliable. But now we come to something odd that we observed while experimenting. And that is actually, if you measure Krippendorf's alpha on this example, you do not get a higher score for the distance function that is visibly better. To better understand this, let's look at some hypothetical data. On the top, we have a very overlapping pair of, uh, of observed and expected distances. And on the bottom, they're more clearly separated. Intuitively, the bottom shows better distinction between observed agreement and what should be expected by chance. However, when we take the ratio of the means, because the means of the red and the blue are exactly the same in both cases, the ratio of the means is the same. And that means you get the same Krippendorf's alpha. So that's the, the first problem we encountered with uh, Krippendorf's alpha is that it can give an undesirable relative score when choosing between distance functions. And that's what has happened when we compared the blue and the glue scores here. If you, if you were to take all of the um, observed distances from the diagonal and put them in a blue histogram and take all the expected distances and put them into the red histogram, you'll see that there's much less overlap for the glue score, but just looking at the ratio of the means um, doesn't capture all that uh, in information uh, compared to looking at the whole distributions. Right. So um, there is another problem we found then with um, applying Krippendorf's alpha to various complex data sets. And that is in its interpretation. So in other words, how do we use this number to decide whether the data is of good enough quality? Uh, and well, uh, Krippendorf's alpha was largely developed looking at Content, uh, content analysis tasks. And for this kind of data, the judgment by Krippendorf was that an alpha above 0 0.8 is good. Uh, on the other hand, 0 0.667 is considered the lowest conceivable limit below which we're supposed to discard the data. 
Now, the caveat was that this shouldn't necessarily be expected to hold for other kinds of data. And that caveat, the caveat is correct because here we have an example where plugging in the glue score for perfectly fine translation data gives a alpha of just of, you know, much lower than 0.667. And we certainly would not want to throw out this data simply because the alpha is so low. So what we do is uh, we propose two distributional uh, alternatives to Krippendorf's alpha when applied to um, complex annotation tasks. And our methods, uh, much like alpha, will take a distance function to collect the observed and expected distances. But then rather than just take the ratio of the means of the distributions, we compare the, the whole distributions. And so one of the proposals is to apply a kolmogorov smirnov test. Uh, this is a test of whether two distributions could be samples from the same population. And we think it looks like a, a better way to answer the question of how different are our annotators' agreements with each other compared to what might be um, expected due to chance. And in the paper, we propose another method, but I'm not gonna talk about it in, uh, in this talk. Um, in our paper, we experiment on seven data sets. Uh, and uh, again, in this talk, I'm just gonna review two of them. So for translations, we looked at the blue score and the glue score but also at a much coarser, uh, cruder distance for natural, uh, for, for string similarity, the Levenstein um, distance, uh, which you might argue is not really appropriate for comparing natural language sentences. And on the other hand, we also look at a much more state-of-the-art neural language model, which is the BERT score. And what we see is that um, kind of as expected, the, the, the cruder method has more overlap and, um, and the ordering is, is also kind of what you might think uh, a priori, that, that um, the, the, the KS and the Kolmogorov smirnov score puts them in an order that corresponds with what we see visually and what we might expect kind of uh, just um, intuitively. Uh, and on the other hand, the, um, the, uh, the Krippendorf's alpha instead would have put the Levenstein distance um, better than the glue score or the, or the blue score, which is a bit counterintuitive. Another data set we looked at was bounding boxes. Uh, and in this case, the favored evaluation functions are intercept over union, um, which IOU, or this more recent generalized intercept over union. A cruder method would be to take the L2 norm between the box, the box centroids, but that would, um, that would ignore information about the box height or the width. So it's, it's, uh, it's less informative. And an even less informative, even cruder method would be simply to take the number of boxes given by annotators, which can vary by annotator, and just take the, the count, the difference in count of boxes. So again, what we see is that um, as you go from like the, the cruder distance functions to the, the more, uh, the, the ones that are considered good, uh, the, the distributions and the KS scores uh, seem to go in the right order. Um, meanwhile, the Krippendorf's alpha surprisingly puts the L2 norm much higher than um, the other uh, the other distance functions, um, which is surprising. So uh, in conclusion, our goal was to figure out how to measure interannotator agreement generally across all kinds of different complex tasks. And this was a, a comprehensive study across seven different comple complex annotation tasks and 24 different distance functions that we tested. Um, in particular, we look at the one uh, existing interannotator agreement measure, Krippendorf's alpha, and learn how to use its generalized form together with uh, distance functions converted from common task-specific evaluation functions. And then we, we propose distribution-based interannotator agreement measures that give a better ranking of distance functions and a more complete picture of how different the uh, observed, and agreements, uh, observed uh, agreements are from chance. Okay, thank you for listening. And the code, uh, in case you're interested, you can find it here at this link. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, I have two questions for you. Um, first one asks, where well, first says it's a really relevant and important topic. Does your suggested method works for Likert scores? Likert scores. Um, can you remind me? This is for looking at ordinal. Uh, ordinal scale. Ordinal yes. scale. Uh, so one of it's not in these slides, but in the paper, one of the data sets we looked at was um, affect, uh, 
um, it's from the, the, the snow paper. Um, uh, I forget the title, but, but there's an affect data set where they are looking at ordinal scores for um, um, different emotional, like, uh, or not emotional, but affect scores for like news headlines. And so they, they go on an ordinal scale from, um, but there, there's about seven of them, right? So, uh, so what we found with that one is um, it like, yes, it works in the sense that um, um, you can use it, it's not going to break down. But I think what we found, what we, what we argue in the paper is that uh, really what the, the methods that we present work better for um, more complex tasks with very large response spaces like translations, bounding boxes, key mm -hmm. points, that. So when you get to ordinal or, or categorical, the response space is so small and there are other papers that do that have that are a little bit more kind of specialized for these kind of things and i think i reference i don't remember exactly um off the top of my head right now um but there there's a there are a couple of papers that i think uh are a little bit better suited for uh for for ordinal um for ordinal tasks okay all right so so that means then the next question will probably be answered in the same way um so they ask what about tasks um, that represent rather subjective scores like fluency of a sentence, sentiment of an affirmation, um, and are using the same sort of ordinal scales for answers? Would a distance in a, a work there as well? But I think we've answered this already. And I think also, if I remember the 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 snow data set, is basically a subjective task. Um, it's it's yes. it's working on um, on um, sentiment towards news, stance towards news, if I remember correctly. Yes, um, and I, I could add one thing about that since you bring up the subjectivity. So yeah. at, the, at the beginning, I, I mentioned really in Tranitator Agreement, the, the number, it's a single number that really uh, tries to answer too many questions. Like, like yeah. are, my, are my workers engaged? Is my task well-defined? Are my, are my question, are my items, you know, like ambiguous? Or is it subjective, right? Because if you have a very subjective task, you will see less agreement. And that doesn't necessarily mean the data is bad. So, so this number, this single number that wraps up all that, it couldn't possibly answer all of that. So one of the things I try to emphasize in this paper is that really uh, for complex tasks, the thing to pay attention to is that in addition to all of those things and can cause disagreements, there's also additional noise from the choice of the distance function. And that's yeah. something that has absolutely nothing to do with the quality of the data. So, so really it must be paid attention to, uh, really what we're trying to pay attention to is that you have to reduce that noise when you're looking at complex data so that you could go on to investigate more clearly the other things that you care about. Thank you. Thank, I, I, I personally love this work. Um, and uh, one of my students just messaged me, it's also here and said, oh, this is, uh, I really like this. I'm gonna use it for my research. So, okay. so that's a feedback for you. But um, so could you comment a little bit on, on metric learning and how, what you're saying here basically yes. that uh, the choice of a distance metric um, is, is, is as important as all the other factors that we know affect the, the, the results and their interpretation. So could you comment how, how this work sits with the field of, of um, okay. metric? Okay, yeah. I will say it's not, uh, it's not extremely connected. The, the metric learning uh, field is more um, kind of an inspiration, in, it, 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 kind, of a, kind of an intuitive support. So, you know, when we, when we propose measures like this for, um, uh, for for measuring agreement, one of the one of the difficulties is it's kind of hard to empirically justify what you're doing, um, uh -huh. right? So you the, so it requires a lot of kind of first principles and intuitive. So uh, so the the field of metric learning is something that like it um, it's it's heavily used and it's 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 pretty established where uh, uh, where they're doing something somewhat somewhat similar of of trying to learn a distance function based on um, how close together things are versus how apart things are. And so um, what, what, I, what, what I take from that kind of is that um, that's a kind of field where, where you, you look at, the, the, you're not just necessarily just looking at like the means, uh, right? And so, and so to justify what we're doing of, of looking at like the, the, how separated the distributions are, 
is related, I guess, to, um, to the approaches in distance metric learning. I wouldn't say that it's, I haven't really, at least I haven't really looked into too much how the other way around or like how what we do might be helpful in that field of distance metric learning, just I'm not too involved in that field. Okay. Um, yeah. Fair enough. No, but I think that's very useful. Um, so, so thank you for this, Alex. 